our main text this morning uh, will be uh, John 14 and 15, actually. We, we looked at a little bit of John 15 last week, where Jesus talked about him being the vine, and we're the branches. We talked about the, the necessity of our connection to him. We'll pick up where we left off last week. Uh, but as you're making your way over there, I wanted to point out that in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, who here has felt weary or burdened at some time? And those who don't have your hands up, I don't resonate with you at all. I, I don't understand how that could possibly be. Who has felt weary or burdened this week? Yes. Everyone to some degree. And Jesus invites us all to come to him in that state and learn from his teaching. Yoke, that was a Hebrew idiom when he says, take my yoke upon you. Yoke was a Hebrew idiom meaning my teaching. He says we can come to him in this state. We can learn from his teaching. We can learn from his life, which was a life of humility. He doesn't say figure things out first and then come to me. He says we can come to him in that state because he is the solution. See, Jesus doesn't just call us to believe in him, although we need to believe in him. He actually calls us and invites us to be his disciples. That means we walk with him, we learn from him, we imitate him. And by the working of his spirit, who he has graciously given us as we've gotten into the waters of baptism, through the working of his spirit, we become more like him. And he promises that this will be what brings the rest and healing to our weary souls. Not just our body. Sometimes we're just physically tired and you can take a nap. He says, I go deeper than that as you walk with me. You know, as we talked about last week, we all have an emotional home that we tend to default to. And that home is a huge factor in determining the kind of fruit produced in our life. If the home we run to when we're in need is some sort of digital distraction, then we're likely seeing the fruit of anger. We're seeing the fruit of just being distracted. We can't focus on anything. Or we see the fruit of insecurity or jealousy or discontentment as we think we're somehow missing out on something that the whole rest of the world has. Or we see the fruit of anxiety, depression, isolation, loneliness. The stats have proven that the rise of the digital age produces that kind of fruit in people's hearts and minds. You know, if the emotional home that we run to is pleasure-seeking, we're likely seeing the fruit of compulsive and addictive behaviors. We see lust in our hearts, emotional numbness, materialism, debt. And none of us wake up in the morning and say, that's what I want today. I want to be filled with anger. I want to be depressed. I want to lust today. I want to be emotionally numb. None of us is what we would wake up and say we want. And yet the fruit being produced in our lives is a result of where we have decided to place our hope and our security. And Jesus invites us to make our emotional home in him. And he promises that will produce a different type of fruit. John 15, where I asked you to turn. We looked at this section last week. In verse 9, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. 
And we talked about this last week, this invitation to remain in him, to abide, the word means. It means to make our home with him. Abide is the verb form of abode, the noun, a home. This is connection language he uses because we were created to be with him. And he says, remain in my love. You can make your home in the security of my love. And this is no ordinary love because when he says in verse 13, the greater love has no one than this to, to lay down one's life for one's friends. He wasn't just giving a statement of philosophy to be pondered. He did that. He did that. And because of that, that's the love we can abide in. In fact, he didn't just lay down his life for his friends, but his enemies. The laying down of his life on the cross for a purpose. To redeem us, his enemies. To redeem us from sin, from the empty way of life. And to reconcile us. To bring us back into the loving arms of our Father in heaven. And then he tells us, the fruit that this produces. If we make our home in the security of his love, if we learn from his yoke of gentleness and humility, we grow in living a life of humbly loving others as we become more and more like him. That's why his command, very simple, love each other as I have loved you. You know, if you're a guest of ours this morning, first time, we are grateful to have you here. For those who were here last week, I just gave a really, really brief recap of what we talked about last week. I want to build off that this morning by looking at a couple of parts of this section that we didn't really touch on last week. Verse 10, he says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. And in verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. This morning we're going to look at the role that obedience plays in our connection to Jesus. And the correlation of obedience and connection really shouldn't surprise us. I mean, consider those who are parents. When your children are disobedient to you, how connected do you feel? It affects the connection, doesn't it? Or even in relationships that aren't necessarily authority relationships, take maybe a sibling or a friend, or your spouse, when there is defiance or disrespect in that relationship, does it not affect the connection? I mean, if you're married and there's defiance and disrespect with your spouse, isn't it cuddle time now? Let's cuddle. We know that they correlate. You know, the title of the lesson this morning actually doesn't have the word obedience in it. It's the victory of surrender. And bear with me, I understand surrender sounds like defeat. I'm surrendering, I'm defeated. But what we're talking about here, bear with me, the role that trust, that surrender to the authority of the one who knows the best for us, therein lies the heart of obedience. Two questions for us to ponder this, ponder this morning the points I have. The first one, do I trust the commands? Now, I'm not going to go through some big litany list of commands for followers of Jesus. Way too many to cover anyway. Just a curiosity, last night I went through Romans 12 and just counted all the commands in Romans 12. Just Romans 12, I counted 29 commands. All right, so that's not what I'm going to do in this point, all right? But there, let's look at John 14. Let's go back one chapter from where we were because as Jesus got into chapter 15 and talked about the vine and the branches and remaining in him and all this connection language, he was talking about obedience leading into that. In John 14, verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever forever. The Spirit of Truth. That's a whole nother Bible study that's amazing. We're not doing that this morning. The other advocate. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. I had my ringer on this morning 
because my wife was going to call me, and now I'm busted. Let me turn it off. So, all right. Verse 20. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. That's what we've been talking about. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. There is a very specific theme leading into and following Jesus' teaching on being connected to the vine on remaining in him, on abiding to him. And that theme is obedience to his commands. Quick summary of what we've read so far this morning. If you love me, keep my commands. Then in verse 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Anyone, verse 23, who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them. He will come to them. Make our home with them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey my teaching. Of course, those two verses in chapter 15, if you keep my commands, you remain in my love. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now, the commands that Jesus is speaking of, we find them in his word. We do. That's why I was able to say, I went to Romans 12 and found 29 of them. But as we look at the different commands in the word of God, they tend to fall in different categories. You have some that are commands regarding morality, meaning really defining what is right and what is wrong of our behavior and of our motives. Some commands we find are regarding priority, what is most important to us, what we are to be devoted to. Some of the commands are very specific to relationships with other people. Fifty-nine passages in the New Testament direct commands about relationships with one another. And of course, Jesus, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment in Mark 12, said this. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And all the commands of morality and priority fall in that. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There we have the relational commands. You know, to be honest... The commands we are called to obey are typically pretty straightforward. We might not know what all of them are, but even that is easily remedied by simply getting into the Word, likely get into the Word with someone else who does know them better than we do, and their context. But even though they're pretty straightforward, anyone with children knows that just because commands are straightforward, that does not mean they're met with disobedience. Can I get an amen from the parents? Come here, Johnny, as they go that way. Put your dishes in the dishwasher as you find them on the counter. Hey, text me when you get there. And you're still waiting days later for the text. The simplicity of the command doesn't necessarily mean they're obeyed. And it's not just children. All of humanity has a precarious relationship with obedience. And while I'm admittedly simplifying quite a bit here, most of us tend toward either being a rule follower or a rule breaker in our nature. Rule followers, meaning people who are more naturally tend to conform to authority, to toe the line mostly out of fear of getting in trouble or to avoid punishment. Rule breakers more naturally tend to rebel against authority. Hey, no one can tell me what to do. 
And this usually stems from a place of arrogance or entitlement. Allow me to give you a fairly simple example from everyday life. You come to a stop sign. No other cars are around. A rule follower's going to stop. Look both ways. When the speed limit's 55, the rule follower's doing 55. Maybe even 54 to be safe. Because they don't want to get a ticket. The rule breaker will come to that stop sign and do a California roll through it. At most stop signs, not just the ones when there's no one around. And they will do 65 in a 55 because they certainly know better what the speed limit should be than whoever decided what it is. And they shouldn't have to be late getting where they're going just because they were irresponsible and left late. Again, arrogance and entitlement. Is this hitting a little too close to home for anybody? We have a precarious relationship with obedience. In addition, though, to our inclination to follow or break rules, we also have other external factors that affect us. I mean, in the country we live in, in the United States, there is a constant tension between the ideas of freedom and governance. Yeah. And that impacts how we see obedience to authority. And while that tension is probably appropriate in the politics of a representative democracy like the USA, the kingdom of God is not a representative democracy. Yeah. It is a theocracy with one king. And that king is Jesus, and he has all authority in heaven and on earth. So there should not be an arguing about the scope of his governance, but we're affected by it. And even within Christendom, within Christendom, there's this history of pitting grace against effort. But biblically, grace, while opposed to earning is not opposed to effort. Actually, grace biblically produces effort. But if we have a tainted view of grace and effort based on our religious experiences, it can affect how we approach obedience. So while Jesus' words, if you love me, you will obey my commands, should be a fairly simple complex concept our natural inclinations, our political leanings, and even our religious experiences can make it much more complicated than it needs to be. You know, back to the idea of rule following out of fear or rule breaking out of arrogance or entitlement. You know, neither one of those is better than the other because neither one lends itself to the type of obedience Jesus is speaking of because neither fear nor arrogance are rooted in trust, the trust required to make our home in his love and actually surrender to his authority. You know, I've actually been guilty of both of these tendencies in my life. Growing up, I feared my dad outright. I feared my dad, so I was very likely to obey my dad. I wanted to stay out of trouble. I wanted to avoid punishment. But over time because it was spurred from fear of punishment, it became more and more about me making it appear that I was obeying him, which really meant I just became good at hiding my disobedience. My mom, on the other hand, I wasn't afraid of her at all. I knew she would support me no matter what. So that must mean I obeyed her, right? Wrong. I took advantage of her kindness by being disobedient because I was confident I could get away with it, arrogance. And my parents sometimes watch these live streams. Um, I don't say it, that's no knock on my parents at all. That's all on me. That's all on how I viewed them and how I acted toward them. Neither one of those helped my connection with my parents because neither fear nor arrogance is rooted in love, which is a trust and surrender 
to the authority in our lives that then produces obedience. But note how I was different toward each parent based on my perception of them, which begs the million-dollar question. That's our second question and point this morning. Do I trust the commander, which in this context is God? A.W. Tozer said this. He said, what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. You know, we think of the different types of commands of God that I referenced earlier, and, and his commands of morality. How do we view the one giving those commands? Do we view him as one who has our best interest in mind, or do we view him as someone who's withholding the good life from us? That's what the devil told Adam and Eve in the garden. God really doesn't have your best interest in mind. He's withholding stuff from you. Or do we believe God's words in Isaiah 48? This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you. Who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands. Your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. God's commands are what is best for humanity. He says, if we obey, that leads to our well-being. And when I read this verse this week, I was reminded of this cartoon that I saw a while back here. You got a guy here jumping over a fence that God's commands uh, representing the fence. He says, I hate being confined by this fence. I'm jumping over it. The other guy goes, wait, it's not a fence. And then you see, it's a guardrail. It's a guardrail. And we often approach God's commands this way. Although they are, as, as though they are confining us. And it's because we don't trust the commander. We don't trust that he is commanding what is best for us, that will lead to our well-being. I would argue that if we look back through history, most, if not all, of the problems that we lament about in our world are a direct result of rejecting or perverting the way of God while pursuing what we, in our arrogance and entitlement, think is the better way. Yeah, I was meditating and praying through Psalm 107 earlier this week, which is a historical psalm, meaning it's a psalm where they're praying through the history of God's people, Israel at the time, and came across this part of that psalm. Speaking of God's people, they sat in utter darkness, bound in painful chains, because they had rebelled against God's commands and rejected the instructions of the sovereign king, a theocracy, Remember, a life in darkness, a life of being bound in pain due to the rejection of God's commands. This is the opposite of the peace and the well-being that God said he intended his commands for in Isaiah 48. You know, when we think of his commands of priority, what should be most important in our lives? Do we view those as coming from someone who knows how to help our soul find rest? Or do we view that as coming from one who's trying to add burden to our lives? Remember Jesus' invitation we read at the very beginning in Matthew 11. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me and you'll find rest for your souls. Our view of God, the commander who gives the command, is paramount, as A.W. Tozer intimated with that quote. Do we trust that he knows what is best? Will we surrender then to his authority by obeying him? You know, I grew up going to church periodically and being read stories from the Bible, I was familiar with Noah's Ark, Daniel and the Lion's Den from a young age. I was familiar with quite a few of the commandments in Scripture, certainly not all, but I wasn't oblivious. I had at least a surface level understanding, 
that Jesus had come to earth, that he died for my sins. And yet as a 21-year-old in college, my life didn't look anything like Jesus, even though I would have claimed and did when someone asked me, are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. But then as things in my life started to unravel, as things started to go awry, I became angry at God. And one night I confronted God in all the ways that I thought he was running my life and the world wrong. And I finished by angrily asking him, why won't you let me be happy? All my arrogance and entitlement coming out. Within a couple of weeks of that time of confronting God angrily, God sent my way someone who knew the scriptures much better than me, and that person guided me through scripture. As he did, a lot was revealed from my heart. While I had a belief in God, I didn't know him well enough to trust him. Therefore, I had not surrendered to him, being the trustworthy authority in my life. Very simply, I was not obeying the commands I did know, and I wasn't seeking to know what I did not know. And to be honest, in all my anger, what I was really experiencing was the fruit of a life of rejecting his ways, sitting in utter darkness and bound in painful chains. That's what had really been going on. But God, in his great mercy, the people he brought into my life at that point used the scriptures to introduce me to Jesus far beyond that surface level understanding I had of him. As I got to know him and know the Father through him, I grew to trust him. And as I got to know what his commands were that I did not know, I was able to surrender to him and commit to a life of obedience because I could finally make my home in the security of his love. His love produces obedience. And I'm certainly not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, which is why I have to remain in his love. It's why grace is something I must grasp it. It needs to be ever present in my life. Not so I'll make no effort, so I'll continue to make the effort to live within his will. You know, an evaluation for us, I, I don't know where each person is at here this morning, but maybe in some stage of what I just talked about. Do you know Jesus enough to trust him? It's one thing to kind of know about him, but our behavior reveals, do, do I really trust him? It was revealed, I didn't trust him at all. Do you know the commands that he has for your life? Do you even know what they are? Are you surrendering to him by obeying these commands? And any stage we might be in this, whatever might be lacking, honestly, of any of these, can be provided simply by getting into the scriptures. You know, for next week's sermon, we're going to look at the power of the word of God in our lives, but don't wait for next week if you need to get in the scriptures to find the answers to some of these things. I mean, discuss this over our chilly lunch today, you know, as we have fellowship with each other. If you don't know where to go to find the answers, seek them from someone who can help you in the stage that you're at. If you're trying to learn to know him enough to trust him, or if you aren't really sure what the commands are for your life, or if you, you know them, but you really need help in surrendering to his authority. Because see, we don't just go to the word for information. We go to the word for transformation. Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount tells this parable. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, hears them and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, but it didn't fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words and doesn't put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. 
The rain comes for both of them. The streams rise for both of them. The wind blows for both of them and beats against their house. But one stands firm and the other falls with a great crash. We are to know Jesus' teachings and put them into practice. That's why we discuss how we can help each other take action to actually do this. Everyone needs honesty about where we're at, and everyone needs accountability for actions that lead to change. Dallas Willard said this. He said, the general human failing is to want what is right and important, but at the same time not to commit to the kind of life that will produce the action we know to be right in the condition we want to enjoy. This is the feature of the human character that explains why the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That experience I shared from my life of Jesus stepping into my life, inviting my weary and burdened soul to come to him, to learn from him, that is something I desire for every person I know and every person I meet to actually take the necessary action and enjoy the fruit of a life of love promised by Jesus. Not just to be people who have good intentions, but we actually walk with him and experience his promises. So since I desire that, I want to close out with this passage in Titus chapter 2. It says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. He steps into every one of our lives. And that grace teaches us. Remember, he says, my yoke, learn from me. His yoke, his teaching, it teaches us to do what? Say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. His yoke of love teaches us to obey and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of, his, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. We can learn from the one who is humble, who's gentle, whose commands are for our good. And my prayer is that we would trust him enough to find our home in the security of his love as he purifies us into people who are eager to do what is good, who are eager to obey him. May we trust him enough to experience the victory of surrendering to the authority of King Jesus. And through this, may we find rest, may we find healing, may we find salvation for our souls.